Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Chitheads podcast. My guest today is Shala Vaidya. Shala is a physician and yoga therapist practicing mind-body medicine in Toronto, Ontario. She studied medicine at Dalhousie University, did her residency in family and emergency medicine at the University of Ottawa, and completed a master's in public health, management, and policy at Harvard University. She has also served as an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University and the University of Toronto. Dr. Vaidya grew up in a cultural tradition of yoga and Ayurveda and has been bridging Eastern wisdom with Western medicine throughout her 20 years of medical practice. She completed her yoga teacher training and yoga therapy training with the Mohans and the Svasta Yoga Therapy. She is the creator of the Yoga of Stress Resilience Burnout Recovery Program and the Reconnect Concussion Program, both of which combine the path of yoga with the science of human function for healing and recovery. As a compassionate change agent, she is affecting change within the healthcare system by healing our healers and by bringing a more holistic approach to the management of stress-related illnesses. And I pronounced compassionate, compassion it, because in the bio, it's uh, compassion dash it. (laughs) So what do you you actually mean by that, uh, Shayla? I, yeah, I mean, uh, make it a little bit more compassion uh, with, focused. with more compassion. More, yeah. More, more compassion focused. Um, and I think, you know, this, this is a totally different uh, subject, but really around medical education and medical training, we are pushed so much that we, uh, get pushed out of that ability to like, we, we burn out on our empathy. Right. And mm. then, and, and we don't have compassion for ourselves as learners or as people working within the healthcare system. And if we don't have for ourselves, we can't give to others. And so most of us, uh, before we start a helping profession, come in as probably the most compassionate people. Um, mm. And with the, the things that we witness, the trauma we witness, the hours we work, it really burns out uh, that ability to maintain, to, to become, or to stay empathic and to have Mm. compassion. Mm. So the compassion it is to really bring it back, bring it back into those of us who do healing work. I love that. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk a bit more about uh, burnout and stress today, which I'm excited to, t- to chat with you about. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, first of all, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank I'm just, you. I'm delighted to uh, to be able to speak with you today. And as we get started, I'd love to hear just a little bit about uh, your own personal story and what has led you to the work that you do. Yeah, well, um, thank you for asking and thank you for having me on. It's an honor to be here. Um, How did I get into it? Well, um, you know, I'm a person of Indian descent, Desi, South Asian, uh, and my family immigrated to Canada. They immigrated in the late 60s, and I was born in Canada in the early 70s. Might be dating myself here, but it's important (laughs) because... (laughs) Because I kind of grew up um, as other in the society yeah. where I where I grew up, right? It um, immigrants were just coming in from South Asia at that time. Uh, I grew up in a culture of of yoga and Ayurveda, like my home, the the food my mother cooked, how things were done, were, was very much following an Ayurvedic kind of lifestyle. And my dad was the yogi and was constantly quoting stuff. And I kind of grew up in a culture of yoga and really kind of was in the fabric of what we did every day. I couldn't draw a line around it and say, oh, we woke up at this time and then we did this and, you know, we did our hour and a half practice. But it was part of the culture. And so um, I, you know, and that was that was interesting because at that time, uh, being other, not even, you know, not being Christian uh, was very it was almost shameful. I would say it was shameful. Like, you know, it, you stood out because of that and and almost ridiculed or looked at as other. And I think that really kind of led me to hide my culture or try to, um, oh, try to, there's that word that I'm forgetting, but like melt in with everybody else, you know, like just kind of acclimate. let it go. Acc- acclimate or even, yeah, there's another word I can't think assimilate. of. But absolute, assimilate. Assimilate. That's the yeah. word, assimilate. And, um, you know, it was always kind of something that I was still drawn to you. Like, and, uh, when I decided to go to medical school, 
My last name, Vedya, it means Ayurvedic physician. It carries that with it. And I, I knew that. And when I went to medical school, I actually wanted to start to bring in or at least study some of the Eastern wisdom and Eastern medicine in Western medicine. And at that time, it was the early or the mid 90s. Uh, I remember asking to do if I could do a project on this. And my supervisor, one of our supervisors said, you know, you can't do that here, but mm. blah, blah, blah. And you know, I heard you can't do that. Um, and so I kind of put it down for a little bit and continued on with my medical practice. And once I started practicing, I've, I had a few experiences that really kind of changed me and how I practiced. And one of them was was working in our First Nations communities, our Northern communities of Indigenous, our Indigenous population, and seeing the effects of what happens when you're cut off from your culture. Yeah. or when your culture is demonized and, you know, and for them, not only were they cut off from their culture, but they were also traumatized in residential schooling. So they have a lot of stress related illnesses. They have a lot of diabetes or lifestyle type illnesses because they've been removed from their traditional lifestyle in such a short time. Um, and I saw that when I was working up there. And then when I came back to kind of Southern Ontario and started working, um, the, in the Toronto area, I, I, where we have a large uh, Indian population, South Asian population, I started working with them and my own people, and I realized they have the same issues. We are struggling with diabetes. We're struggling mm. with mental health issues, stress, all of this stuff, because again, we're cut off from our culture. And I just started in my medical practice and my family practice, starting to bring yoga techniques back. So when I talk about yoga, I talk about meditation, everything, the movement, everything, because it, it wasn't split off into mindfulness, compassion, right. you know, asana or whatever. It was the whole thing. And so I started bringing it into my um, family practice. And eventually I learned of the research behind it all. And I knew when I first saw like one of, I was teaching one of my um, anxious patients about uh, just meditation. And she said, oh, you're doing mindfulness. And I was like, well, what's mindfulness? And this was about 2010 at that point. And I looked it up and I saw all the research that was being done on these techniques. And I knew then that, okay, this is, this is where my career is gonna take me. This is actually what my dream is, was to bring the two together. So, um, and the other thing that was really powerful is I also started screening around that time. I screened my patients for the adverse childhood experience score. Hmm. And uh, that's a score that was first published in 1997 out of, um, uh, out of Kaiser Permanente by Dr. Vincent Folletti. And, you know, looking at how experiences, stressful experiences in your childhood could affect your health down the road. And what I realized was all the people I was teaching techniques from yoga and meditation were all people who had adverse childhood experiences, they had childhood trauma. And um, yeah, that just really, it was like, wow, I, there's nothing in my medical toolbox that can help these people, but my yoga toolbox can really, it really seems to help. Um, and so, you know, it helps them and it certainly helped me. So. Yeah. And that's why I started to use it. It was like, these are, I've experienced stress growing up. I've experienced stress in my career. Every time I went back to these practices, because there was something about them that when I did them, I felt different after, you yeah. know, there was some transformation in my personal state. And so that's all I had left to teach. And I'm just really blessed right now uh, at this stage and time that we have the research uh, to do this and that, you know, people in the medical community are excited about yeah. these types of techniques. So, yeah. So I, I would love to ask a little bit about, about that because I, I do want to speak a bit more um, um, specifically about the work that you're doing now, which is, you know, so wonderful and interesting. But I'm curious because since you have sort of witnessed, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, being a child in, this, in the 70s and, and, and 80s, which of course, you know, as everyone knows, was a very different kind of cultural landscape. And, and yeah. there was, you know, uh, presumably a lot more resistance to, um, to other cultures, just otherness in general. And so, you know, did you, when you moved into medicine, was, the, had the tide already shifted enough such that, you know, people were open to the intersection of Western and Eastern medicine? Or did you experience a bit of resistance to that? I'm just curious about, you know, what kind of obstacles you had to, to face as you, as you began to work at that intersection. 
Yeah, well, early on, it wasn't even mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't even a thought. And I think I kind of shut it down so much. And the process of medicine and of becoming a doctor is, is a very, it's, it's a, it's a pretty tough process. Yeah. You know, you come in as who you are, this person who's traveled and has many other views and, you know, very compassionate and you really get put through the ringer. Mm. Um, so it's such a process that we all kind of come out looking the same. I know a friend of mine said, it's like you, you come in as a, like a piece of clay and they, with many different dents and they mold you into a cube and you can mm -hmm. only be a cube after. <laughs> Um, and so I don't think I really retouched with yoga until I started to burn out myself. Mm. Um, and I practiced asana and I practiced uh, pranayama when I was a resident just as a way to release. I was too tired to do other exercise. So I just did that. And it was really at that time early on, it was really a personal thing. And I think a lot of the other physicians and residents that I knew new yoga and we're doing it for themselves. And around that time was the beginning of the, the, the 2000s, the millennium. And at that time, yoga really took a boom. So then yeah. people were practicing it on their own. Um, and, uh, and it, be, it started to become this other thing, this huge force in, in Western society. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't really brought into medicine and that I know of, like it was there, but I wasn't really exposed to it. Uh, until I started doing it. And then I realized, oh, there are actually people who have been doing mindfulness for 20 years. And the research started coming out in the 80s. So by the time I started to say, hey, you know what, my next gig, it's the yoga MD. I think everyone was like, that's really cool. Like, I know how it feels. And it's interesting, like physicians would say, I know how it feels. And it's interesting because I do do talks for physicians and little retreats and workshops and they don't care about the science, which is hilarious because they're <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we know. They know that it's not that they don't care about the science. I shouldn't say that. They know that I have researched it and I'm doing it and they see what it's doing for their patients. So they mm. just want to come in and have that experience for themselves. And at, you know, this generation of physicians, many of them do yoga and we know the benefits of meditation. We can see the science about it. So, um, now I don't really get a lot of, I don't get a lot of resistance at all. And I haven't, I haven't gotten resistance. What I've actually gotten is people who are very interested in what it is I'm doing and they, and a lot of respect for kind of paving a path and, um, turning the ship in another direction. That's so incredible. I'm really that's yeah. incredible. And I'm actually, I'm really surprised to hear that, um, that many doctors don't really need the quote unquote scientific justification to, to, to sort of believe in these things or to trust that they are, you know, working because they've actually experienced it themselves. Um, and I do want to talk a little, go ahead. I want to just jump in. They do need the scientific, <laughs> they don't, they do. And I think most of them can feel it. Right. And most of them understand how hard it is to study things like this. Mm. So they're happy that the science is there and I still bring it up. I just don't dwell on it so much because, um, because they really want to get to the practice. They only have so much time. So they're like, yeah, let's just practice. You've written it up. It works. I've seen it. Great. Let's do it. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with burnout, which is something that, mm -hmm. you know, you developed a program around, um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you were talking about how you experienced yourself, you know, a significant period of burnout. And, and so I just, I just want to talk about burnout for a second. You know, what is burnout? How does it differ from stress? And, you know, how can yoga help? Yeah, well, burnout is um, actually an occupational diagnosis, according to the World Health Organization. They don't mm. actually, um, they kind of say it's, it's something that happens because you're in a situation that is stressful. Um, and, and the, the burnout is a result of the occupation. And that's done for a couple of reasons. Um, but burnout in the body or stress in the body is, is what we're talking about when we're talking about burnout. And mm -hmm. stress is something that goes into the body and we're built for stress, but we need to discharge it. It needs to complete its cycle, right? In order for us to return to a healthy baseline. And what happens in states of chronic stress when we're not able to discharge that stress is that builds up and we stay in either a very hyper aroused stress response where we're releasing a lot of adrenaline and cortisol, and that's affecting a lot of our metabolic um, and inflammatory processes in the body. Um, and that's where it can be, affect medical illness. So, uh, when we're talking about burnout, it's a real big umbrella term and there's many things that fit under it. 
Um, and especially in my field in medicine, it's not just burnout. You know, burnout can be thought of as, or it can be given like a weakness. Oh, you burnt out. There must be something mm -hmm. wrong with you individually. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's actually, we're burning out as humans because the society in which we live and work is not affording us the opportunities to discharge that, that stress, to come back to rest, to allow our nervous systems to, to function normally outside of a stress state so that we can then, you know, go into another acute stress state and return from it. And that's really what burnout is to me. Um, in the medical field, there's many contributors to burnout. So we have moral distress and moral injury. And that's what we're experiencing uh, right now oh, with yeah. COVID, right? There's a lot of distress. And moral distress is when you know you can do something, right? You know how to help. You know what needs to be done but you can't do it because of systemic issues or volume issues or shortages or something that's preventing you from doing it. And then moral injury happens when, um, you know, you try to do, or you want to do something and you can't, you actually prevent it from doing it. And that's, it's an injury because you can't do it. Something has prevented you and you're almost blamed for it, you know? And mm -hmm that's a really that's a really tough thing for a lot of frontline workers to take on and i'm including teachers in that too because they're on the front line of trying to care you know educate a population of children right now so they're also experiencing a lot of stress and we're not necessarily prepared for this right we yeah. don't all have the personal protective equipment we have shortages you know the other day i heard on the radio that we may have to start rationing oxygen you know oh like oh my god I know, you know, this is this is where we're getting to. Um, it's real. And I don't think people understand how real COVID is. And it may not be that bad for someone who's younger uh, or who is completely healthy. But if you're super healthy and have a really um, strong immune system, you may get sicker because your active immune system is trying to attack something it's never seen before. So we're still seeing people who are healthy get very sick. And viral load is something that people aren't really talking about either. But as the virus grows and spreads in the community, it gets stronger. So depending on what end of the infection that you you may get, it can affect you maybe mildly or it can affect you, you know, it can cause, it can cause death. It can cause inflammation, stroke, blood clots. We're only now learning about the side effects. So this is real and it's serious and we need to take it seriously. So, so when you say... Um that it's the virus so gets stronger as it uh, spreads through the community. What do you mean by that? Are you saying that the actual, volume. the volume? I'm saying the volume, the amount of virus. The virus is also mutating. Whether it's getting stronger or weaker on mutation depends on that virus. But I'm just saying as the viral load in the community, uh, that's really what I mean by that statement. Yeah, that, you know, yeah, that it's going to be stronger as the viral load is higher. Do you think so. even with the mutation of the virus that the the vaccines will still be, you know, be able to 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 handle it? I mean, you know, when I hear of mutation, I think, oh, then the va vaccine won't be effective. But is that not how it works? No, it's not how it works. Um... I mean, maybe, but uh, vac uh, viruses are made up of a string of proteins and mm. vaccines take um a protein sequence to present to the immune system. So the immune system can say, hey, uh, you know, here's the enemy, you know, this is what the enemy looks like, let's fight it. And it learns how to fight that enemy so that the next time the body is exposed to it, um, the immune system can, can say, oh yeah, here's the enemy and the immune system can then attack it. So we're hoping that the mutations um, that come with co with most viruses uh, don't change and the virus the vaccines will be effective and they'll be monitoring that so there there are different strains of COVID that they found and they are monitoring to make sure um, much like the flu that the vaccine would be um, good for the strain that's out there. I see. So yeah. um, so before we talk about stress and kind of you know the general population i i want to wow. stay here in the um conversation around you know frontline workers and and just like yeah. the healthcare industry and yeah. i want to go back to what you were saying at the very beginning about compassion and i thought it was very interesting that you point out that there is and correct me if i'm wrong there is this tendency as one gets kind of 
continuously exposed to sort of terrible things as you would at you know working at a hospital or working in in healthcare in various ways you become desensitized to that and and that the compassion actually can dissipate and i'm I, and so i'm curious a little bit about that and and to what degree you think that's a problem and how you know, we could remedy that or, or, or things that people who are working very close to, you know, health and traumas in various ways can mm-hmm. make sure that they don't become desensitized. Yeah, well, that's, I'm glad you're pointing this out. Um, you're right. When we witness trauma or we bear witness to it or we're around it, we as people who are witnessing can experience secondary trauma or vicarious traumatization. Mm-hmm. Secondary trauma is used one, one or two episodes, vicarious traumatization traumatization is the buildup of the secondary trauma. Um, And like I said before about that stress response, we need to, we will go into have an acute stress response, but then we need to discharge, return to safety and rest. And if we're not able to do that safely, we're going to be left with uh, a trauma response that's not able to process um, and that can come back and, and uh, you know, turn into PTSD or turn into uh, the secondary vicarious traumatis- traumatization we see in burnout. And what's interesting, and this is research that comes from Dr. Tanya Singer at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, is, um, you know, they looked at empathy and training people in empathy. And they what they did was they... Um, and they trained medical students in empathy, um, and they realized they actually got worse. And that's because the nervous system, the limbic system, uh, is experiencing that empathy. And when and the nervous, the limbic system is the home of our stress response. It's there to help us um, maintain safety, right? Mm-hmm. So prevent pain, maintain safety, keep us well. So when we're experiencing too much distress. We're going to go from a hyper aroused situation where we may be challenged and where we can be helpful to a place where we're getting overloaded and our body will actually shut down so that we're not feeling all that stress anymore. And that's biological. Um, And what they studied at the Max Planck Institute, and I didn't get into all the details, but um, when they trained people in compassion, that compassion works on a different neural network. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have that skill of generating compassion from within, we can actually flood our nervous system, our brain with catecholamines and mammalian caregiving hormones, oxytocin, you know, all of those love kind of hormones that actually reduce the stress that's being experienced in the limbic brain to help us stay more present. And so, you know, that's a really important component of how we can teach people to do this. Now, is that going to solve the traumas of war or the traumas of witnessing the sheer amount of the large number of deaths, probably not, but at least it can soothe ourselves. We can start to soothe ourselves with that. And as we each do it for ourselves, we can build a more compassionate atmosphere. Yeah. And that's important. And and the other thing that's really important right now too, and that's kind of happening and we see this in the military as well is right now, a lot of healthcare professionals you know, they're on the team, they're together, they're supporting each other. Society at the beginning of the the pandemic was supporting them as well. And society was taking precautions against the spread. And so, you know, you feel like somebody's got your back, you know, and, and that's, that reduces the stress response as well, because it feels safe. Now, when people start to drop because they're getting burnt out, you know, um, they're getting tired, they may not be able to maintain that camaraderie as much. Or when they see, you know, people in the community not wearing masks or not following rules, like that can cause distress and cause burnout because we can't control what everybody else is doing. But we see down the road, like we know where this is going and we are already overloaded. So that can generate a lot of stress. And so, you know, within the hospitals, each individual, you know, we always say there's like individual response, your sangha, your community response, and then, um, you know, all beings, right? We, mm-hmm. we think of, of th- those three layers that, you know, teaching compassion to ourselves and especially starting early in medical school and nursing school, physio, all of that can be such a huge thing because as we start to become more compassionate to ourselves, we'll become more compassionate to others. And then as we start to teach, it's going to start to roll through that. And then of course the patients are going to feel it. And even if we're just practicing compassion for ourselves, not for the other person, 
what's so amazing about our nervous system is uh, these mirror neurons or this way that we connect with each other, right? Our social engagement systems that when we're practicing compassion and calming ourselves down, the people around us start to feel more calm. Yeah. They start to feel that compassion as well. So um, it's like the gift that keeps on giving, but it's not the only gift. We also have to do, <laughs> we also have to employ social justice and employ um, or, or make sure that we're working in, we're keeping environments that are safe and that allow our healthcare providers an opportunity to take a break and to release the stress and to recover from those acute periods of stress so that it's not building up. Mm -hmm. And what's really hard right now is the isolation piece too, yep. that many people, uh, many, many people who are listening know what it's like to maybe not see their roommates, their friends, their family, um, and that's really hard on our nervous systems because we're social beings. Um, and our and just for people to understand, our social where we feel social pain is the same place we feel physical pain in our brain. Mm. Um, Dr. Nancy Eisenberger from um, Naomi Eisenberger, sorry, from UCLA did research on that. Um, and I think it's it's really amazing, you know, that we feel social pain the way we feel physical pain. And that's definitely adding to the stress that, all of us are feeling right now. Um, and a lot of healthcare providers might not be able to uh, see their family or visit their family or be around their loved ones or do the things that reduce their stress, much like the rest of us aren't able to do that. And that's contributing to the buildup of stress as opposed to the release and the, the ability to come out of our stress response, the completion of that stress response so that we can go on. We're carrying that with us as we go mm -hmm. on and that's leading to chronic stress. So one question I have about, you know, just in terms of compassion and generating compassion, can you speak directly to, you know, if someone's listening, they're like, oh, you know, I don't know even how, know how to have compassion for myself. Like, where do I begin? What is a useful strategy or technique to begin that path of generating or cultivating compassion within oneself? Yeah, that's such an excellent question, because I think it's actually very difficult for most of us to generate compassion for the self. But most of us have compassion for others, right? We have mm -hmm. compassion for our friends, for our family, our grandparents, for babies, for our pets. And that's often where I start is just start to, you know, imagine yourself in the presence of that person who gives you joy or that being that gives you joy. And most often it's people's puppies or their dogs. <laughs> it's not necessarily. It's amazing how easy children. it is to love your dog, you know? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and if you don't have a dog right now, that's very hard too. Um, but their kitten or even a loving grandparent, like bringing that up and, you know, seeing if you can envision that in your mind, focus on that and just start to feel what it feels like to be around that person and how you might not want that person to suffer. Right. And then compassion is an action. It's the act of alleviating suffering. So it would even be something as simple as in your mind's eye, you know, offering words of loving kindness or kind words to this person um, because you don't want them to suffer. Right. Or maybe it's in your mind giving them a blanket or a cup of tea or offering them something to help soothe suffering or help soothe the fact that they may be alone or in their experience. All of us have that in our hearts as in, as humans, right? Most of us, let's say most of us, uh, you know, because sometimes it may have gotten, we may have had experienced so much trauma that it got taken out of us. And then compassion is actually very difficult to experience because it is so the opposite of what we experience internally daily. Yeah. But that's where I would start is to just really start about that, that connection, that desire to alleviate other people's suffering or other, another being suffering just because then you know what that feeling is. And as you get comfortable with that and offering it to someone else, then maybe you can bring yourself into that, um, into that equation as well. See yourself with the other as part of your meditation um, and start to bring it to yourself. Practicing self-compassion can be really hard. And Kristen Neff, Dr. Kristen Neff did the research on uh, a lot of this, but it can be really hard because talking to ourselves in a compassionate voice or a kind voice even, maybe be completely different than the voice we're used to hearing in our head. Um, and it can be startling because that inner critic that's often there or the critical voice or whatever the voice is, 
that often came up or evolved in our head for some reason. Maybe it kept us safe or maybe, you know, it provided some reason for it to be there. So when we start having the compassionate voice, and when I talk about the compassionate voice, I'm not necessarily talking about the angel that says you can eat all the cookies or eat all the ice cream, <laughs> you know, because that's kind of you know, like the angel voice. and devil. Yeah, but it's, I like that voice too. Um, <laughs> but it's more one, a compassionate voice is more one that kind of, is kind to you and holds you accountable, right? Yeah. So, um, so it's if we can start to develop that um, and even connect with ourselves, you know, I know embodiment is this huge thing now in psychotherapy. Yoga has had it for centuries in many of the Eastern traditions, and 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 um, indigenous traditions have always worked through the body. Um, but even, you know, like maybe giving yourself a hug or putting a hand on your heart if that's comfortable, or even like wrapping yourself in a blanket as a compassionate action, maybe a way to start to ease into being compassionate to yourself and self-compassion. So mm, those beautiful. are ways I think to start and allow that. Give yourself permission to, to allow that to happen. Allow yourself to be kind to yourself. Mm. Such important words. So uh, Shala, back to stress. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now that, you know, you're, you're talking, you started talking a little bit about COVID related stress. And I'm just curious, um, you spoke about the element of isolation, but are there any other things that are kind of unique about this particular stressful situation? You know, what, it, what, you know, from a kind of medical healthcare perspective, like what is unique about the sort of constellation of elements that are making up this stressful moment and, and how can, um, the practices of yoga really help us at this time? Yeah. Well, I mean, COVID is novel, right? So new. Yeah. We don't know everything about it yet. We don't know its long-term consequences. And yeah. therefore, we don't really know, like, I hate to say we don't really know what to do, but we're figuring out what to do. We know a lot more now yes, than we, know, we did yeah. at the beginning of the year, for sure. And there's not one right way, right? And it's it's complex. So that can be scary for people. It can cause a lot of anxiety because it's unknown. Um, and I think what what is so, you know, so when we go into anxiety, of course, our mind races and we get caught into the this thinking that we can't solve that problem right now. And, you know, yoga is all about chitta vritti nirodha, like to mm -hmm. slow down the racings of the mind, to come out of that and to bring us back to this present moment. Um, bring us to this idea of Ishvara Pranhana, that where we surrender to the things we can't control. That's not mine to carry and ground ourselves, that's where I think yoga can be really helpful. Um, and the process, the eight limbs of yoga, looking at the yamas and the niyamas, how we treat ourselves, how we treat others, recognizing that as a global community of humans, we are in this together. And you know, we need to treat ourselves well, but we also have to have that respect for others. And then, you know, as we follow the eight limbs of yoga, um, asana, the movement, can just help us release stress because stress goes into the body. It needs to be discharged from the body. We can talk about it all we want, but it's really that action of moving it out of the body that helps us. The pranayam, like working with the breath, especially exhaled focused breath, you have lots of information on exhaling, being able to stimulate our parasympathetic rest and digest nervous, nervous system. So that can help us. Um, the pratyahara, the sensory withdrawal, dhanandhyana and samadhi, like coming back to a place of meditation to bring mm -hmm. us back to this present moment, grounding right now, that we might not be able to control everything that's out there, but this moment, we, we, we're we okay. You know, we're okay in this moment. And as we walk the path of yoga, and we recognize it's not just our own path. Like it's not just about our own enlightenment. It's, it's yeah. the enlightenment, you know, my freedom is linked to your freedom. My enlightenment is linked to your enlightenment. It's all of us um, doing all these things. And you know, what COVID has taught us and this year 2020 has taught us, it's really brought up into the limelight, the issues that were there that maybe were easy for us to kind of not look at or to brush aside. And now they're here. Um, the health disparities, um, mm. the disparities between race, the disparities between societies, all of this stuff is coming up now and it can be very overwhelming. And so yoga can help us ground, but then also help us focus. Okay, what's important right now? 
how do we move forward, right? What's the world we're going to build out of this? Mm. So I don't know if that's too broad an answer, but... Uh, no, I think it's a great answer. I, yeah, and I like how you, um, just a moment ago, you touched on kind of social disparities and um, and inequalities, and um, which is a good thing to touch on as we segue now into um, another topic, but a topic that I hope will kind of tie together um, based on our, you know, uh, conversation around stress that we've been having. Um, and that's mm -hmm. with regards to cultural appropriation. And I had, yeah. um, I, you recently had a, a lovely conversation with the um, interviewer on the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And I was really touched and, and moved by kind of your personal reflections on how shame was really shame about your own cultural practices and 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 around your ability to to perform and participate in them as an indian person in a majority white culture how that shaped mm -hmm. you and how um you know uh you were then uh i don't know if surprised or shocked is the right word but um frustrated in various ways um by you know then encountering the um, use of you know your cultural symbols in um, in this kind of majority white yoga environment. So mm -hmm. I wanted to um, talk a little about this and, and maybe hear mm -hmm. you know from you your personal experience and and you mm -hmm. also made before uh, earlier before we started the interview you talked about how we could kind of link this discussion to the discussion around stress and isolation that um, that we've been talking about with regards to. To COVID. Yeah, well, it's very much the same physical experience, isn't it? That mm. many of us with COVID are going through what it feels like to be isolated, what it feels like to be stressed. Um, and these were the same physiological or feelings that I had growing up, uh, maybe being teased for, um, for my culture or teased for, you know, Indian food smells, right? Being teased because yeah. I smell. Uh, being teased about my name, people not being able to pronounce my name, um, being teased for the culture. Like, uh, you know, you didn't feel, you didn't feel comfortable necessarily celebrating Diwali or celebrating other things that were important. And so because of that, my own culture kind of got downplayed and yeah. I was almost embarrassed. I remember being a kid and being in class and we had to, this is just a memory that I'm having, we had to tell our teacher what our parents' names were and everybody's parents' names were John and Mary and David and, you know, and my parents' names were Om and, and Kiran and I was embarrassed to say my dad's name because I was like, oh, it's so different. I'm going to yet again be different. I'm the brown kid, right? Like, I'm the one who's not like the others. And that was really hard. It was actually tearful. Like, I, I remember having, like, tears in my eyes. Cause I, and I remember, like, cause I didn't want to say his name, which is terrible. And, I, of course, the world has changed so much now. I, I don't think, I would hope kids wouldn't have that feeling now um, to say their names. But um, so then it was really hard. Uh, you know, you spend your life trying to to fit in. Um after having been teased or even it's the look, right? Like it, I think people may downplay the effect of microaggressions. Yeah, absolutely. Right. The, you know, like just little looks or subtleties or, Oh, we'll just say it this way, or we'll just do this. Um, and how that takes away from your identity or how that shuts you down. Um, and there was a lot of that. And so then, you know, as I said, in the, in the two thousands, as yoga started to boom, um, people were taking on Indian names and they were doing all these things with the Om symbol, you know, the Om mm -hmm. symbol, very much like the cross or the star of David, um, is a sacred symbol for Hindus. Mm -hmm. Um, and to see it kind of plastered everywhere and to see like mantras on people, like tattooed on people's, uh, on people's feet or something, it just, it, it's not, it's not how we would treat it. And so it's kind of like a double whammy when that happens. And, I remember going to yoga conferences and you walk in and everyone's white, everyone's like skinny and in Lulu. And it's just, it's so, you know, and then people like when I would talk, talk to people, people like saying, Oh, you should take my yoga teacher training or you should do this with me. And it was just like, like, do you not see who I am? Do you not see <laughs> You're like, Girl. where this comes from? Yeah. Like, I'm brown. I'm Indian. This is a part of my culture. Mm -hmm. I could teach you, actually. Um, and, you know, so it was, it was real. it's really hard. 
and I don't know what else to say it, but I felt dismissed. I felt that it was hard. I felt people once again, don't see me and not being seen. That's what we all, we all want to be seen. We all want to be loved. Right. And that disconnection that happens again, we were talking earlier about that, that social center, a social pain center in our limbic brain is the same or it's in our insula is the same place uh, where we feel physical pain. Yeah. We really feel that. And, and I felt that, and I remember going to, um, I mean, so many episodes with this, right? Like walking into a yoga studio, having somebody, uh, sing Kirtan, which is a beautiful hymn, but like being again in like workout clothes, not having my hair covered. Like, it's like, this isn't how we perform this music. This is very sacred. Um, going to yoga conferences and meeting people who would introduce me with their, their yoga name. Um, <laughs> And then like not rec like the th it's just, it's hard because, you know, that's not necessarily the name they put on their resume to get a job. But if I put my name on a resume to get a job and it sounds different, I mean, research shows, studies have showed, I will be less likely to get that job because if my name sounds ethnic and we mm -hmm. see this all the time, if I have a black sounding name, if I have a Chinese sounding name, you know, depending on where, you know, where you're applying for jobs, it can get, it can be held against you. So to have people take on names, um, and listen, I know people who have gotten names from their guru. They, they are, um, they're well studied. They respect the tradition. Those aren't the people I'm talking about. I do have respect yeah. for them. I will tell you, I, I hold a little bit of a grudge until I meet them. And then when <laughs> I get like, oh, I get your story now. All right, that's fine. Um, but it's, it's just really hard. And people kind of using the symbols uh, for sale uh, to promote themselves and to say how yogi they are and whatever. It's just, it's, it's I don't know, it's almost like a slap in the face. It's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Well, one, uh, thing that, one thing that sort of stood out to me um, as you were speaking about, um, you know, feeling not seen in what, you know, of all spaces should be the pl space in which you feel most seen, right? And yeah. in a space that is purporting to be, um, you know, a kind of yogic environment. And it's interesting because it made me think of how, um, you know, and and we'll talk about whether or not you think this changing in a minute, but how, especially in the early days of kind of yoga transposition, or maybe particularly in the 90s and 2000s, mm -hmm. when it became much more explosive and much more affiliated with, you know, just exercise, right, that it's yeah. almost like the, the, there has been this reconstruction by, you know, majority white people with yeah. these symbols and iconography and all of this stuff. And yet it's a reconstruction of an environment that's been reconstructed in a way that you're excluded from, you know, and that brown people are yeah. excluded from. And it's only really now in the last couple of years that we're having these conversations and, um, and, and really recognizing, seeing for the first time what, what that, you know, what the violence is of that. And, and so I'm curious, wow. you know, how your, what your perspective is now sort of in the current environment where, where there's really a lot more attention being placed on, on, on remedying this in various ways or being sensitive and, and maybe your own, um, thoughts or suggestions uh, for, you know, people um, practicing yoga and interested in, in the Indian traditions, um, what you think is a good kind of approach? Yeah. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of confusion at the beginning when it came in terms of what is and what isn't yoga and what is uh, Desi South Asian culture, right? Like I think yeah. it all kind of got mixed into yoga. Um, and in the early days it was really hard and um, yeah, I think many of us, it's so hard, like, because, you know, it's a way to experience a different culture, which I think is important, right? And to open your eyes to a different culture and to learn about something different. And I think there's a lot of value in that. Mm -hmm. I think it becomes difficult when things aren't used appropriately, when we lose the actual meaning of yoga as a philosophy, as a psychology, yeah, when I have to say yoga and meditation, as opposed to recognizing <laughs> meditation is a part of yoga. I know, but you know what? This happens also in the mindfulness community. I remember teaching a, a mindfulness course with a, a teacher who is a wonderful person, but I remember her t telling somebody to uh, telling one of the students, oh, this isn't yoga. And, you know, oh, and I was just goodness. like, mm, right, like, wait a second, like, what is your understanding of mindfulness uh, and the root of it? So sometimes we take pieces of the tradition 
maybe it's just the exercise or just the med you know part of the meditation and we lose the whole package and in that way um, we lay down like because yoga is a process of transformation we're laying down new samskaras if we don't understand mm -hmm. all the pieces we may actually get caught up in laying down the wrong pattern so if we get caught up in yoga being exercise we may actually do the wrong exercise so it still feels good at the time because exercise does but yeah. then it's not taking us down the right road and what i see is that it takes a lot of people down the road of ego you know, mm -hmm. asmita, which is one of the clashes, which is one of the things we're trying to renounce. So we can really get lost because we're missing pieces. You know, another thing I saw with the um, the aerobic um, development of yoga is that, you know, in Indian culture and in, in South Asian culture, I don't call it just India because it's it's a very broad uh, continent, the South Asian yeah. continent. There is a culture um, of different life stages, right? So that your early life stage, you may practice in a certain way. Student life, you'd practice in another way. When you get to household, you might need to conserve your energy more and practice in a certain way. And then you get older uh, and your practice again changes. And yet what I saw was people doing a very aggressive Ashtanga, Patavi Joyce Ashtanga, uh, practice maybe that they learned when they were 18, when they were 40 or 50, and they're like, yeah. why am I getting hurt? Mm -hmm. Why are, you know, or they're doing poses without actually understanding why they're doing that pose, right? Like this is a sequence and this is what we do as opposed to what is it that my body needs right now mm -hmm. to help me come into a centered state, right? Um, and so it gets applied incorrectly. And what I see in the mindfulness community is this, oh, mindful, you're just supposed to watch and be aware and not really respond to anything. And it's like, well, that's that's traumatic for people who have trauma, because if they sit in meditation and their nervous systems start to calm, these things are going to come out. And if we don't have, you know, if we're not aware of the side effects of what can happen when we start to practice, we can actually do more harm with some of these practices. So it's really important that as students of yoga, of, as teachers of yoga, that we understand and that we're studying, um, you know, the yoga sutras, we're studying the basics, we're studying the effects of what it is we're teaching. And we understand the latent impressions, the samskaras that we're laying down, right? Mm -hmm. Because how are these causing transformation to allow us to get to freedom? That's yeah. our goal. And when we forget about that, or we don't, we're not even aware of that, then we can um, we can really practice incorrectly. I love that you're pointing out about, you know, not a, it's not a one size fits all. And it's like, you know, we're all seeking freedom, right? But it's, you know, yeah. depending on our own um, experiences of trauma, our own kind of so socioeconomic position, our experiences in life, the roadmap mm -hmm. might look a little different. And yeah. as I hear you, I can really hear your yoga therapy training because that's what I really admire about the Krishnamacharya lineage is, is mm -hmm. you know, Krishnamacharya, the, you know, the father of modern yoga, right, is yeah. the is the one who was prescribing different things to different people. And then the, the thing that gets most passed down uh, despite that is this kind of, you know, and I don't want, I'm not criticizing Ashtanga no. or Ashtangis, but it is a sort of one size fits all kind of model, right? Yeah. And I think what's so brilliant about Krishnamacharya is that when you study with the students and see what they teach, right, and you look at who they are as people, you can see, okay, he gave them this practice because this is what they needed to work on, right? He gave that person that practice because that's what they need to work on. And of course, they kind of know it, but then they're like, a lot of them, not all of them will say, this is how my teacher taught it. And this is how it's done. And it's like, no, the beauty of what your teacher taught you is that they saw you and what you needed at that time in your life. And they gave you a practice for that time, mm -hmm. you know, and as you go deeper, you see that there's all these other layers that transforms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for listeners who are, who are hearing you and kind of excited by this idea of engaging in a yogic practice that is sort of, in a sense, prescribed for, or that takes into consideration their own personal experience and where they're at, mm -hmm. what kind of advice would you have for individuals who only up until now have experienced sort of like, I went to a yoga class and the sequence was the same for everybody. And that's what I know as yoga asana to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, there's so many different teachers. Yeah. So what I usually say, because we don't know what's in everybody's community is try a few people out and it's who you resonate with and who you feel better with 
like it's a natural feeling and it may last a couple of days or whatever, but it's who you resonate with. If most people teach what they need to do themselves. And so you find a teacher who is doing that. And then that may change over time as you need something different. But I think that's the easiest way. Um, and then to do some research, right? Look around and see who's out there, read books, um, go to people. You know, there's a lot of yoga experts right yeah. now and that's um, and they may have a million followers and whatever, but read about their journey and read about um, who they studied with. And the thing is a lot of really great yoga, and I don't mean to, to upset anyone who has a, a really big yoga studio or a chain or whatever, but a lot of really great yoga happens in people's houses and mm -hmm. in church church basements or in the church hall, you know, like because people who are true to the practice are the people you want to try to find. It's not necessarily the people who are the money makers who are going to sell you a program and, and promise you something. Mm -hmm. It's often the quiet people in the back um, that are practicing and sharing what resonated with them, you know, Amazing. Hard to find, but those are usually, that's usually where, those are where I find the gems anyway, so. Yeah, so just keep an open mind and search around and try different things. Yeah, mm. and, and you know, you mentioned Krishnamacharya, you mentioned there are some, you know, people who have studied and done a lot of different yoga studies. I studied with the Mohans, many people studied with Desikachar. Of course, every time somebody studies with someone, again, it's going to be how they've interpreted the mm -hmm. teachings and how they practice. So it is gonna evolve and change, but just making sure they're kind of staying with the basics, right? Like right. The, the, the basics don't change, yeah. Mm. And is it important for to, from your perspective, you know, especially based on the, the conversation we had, have been having about cultural appropriation, that there's a connection to lineage? Yeah, you know, lineage, lineage is a tough one for me because it's not one that I resonate with other mm. than having done my, uh, yoga teacher training through Savasta and through Krishnamacharya yeah. because for me, my lineage would be like, well, my dad and my uncles and my cousins mm -hmm. and, you know, like it's, I've learned it through my family. So um, I think it's important, especially here and as, especially as people often and should uh, thank and appreciate and acknowledge their teachers that you recognize that there's different schools and different ways that this philosophy, because it is a philosophy, much like all philosophies have been interpreted and practiced. Yeah. So, you know, it's worthwhile checking out a few. I'm not going to say mine is better than yours. Um, I think that each one teaches it in a way that resonates with them. And it's you are your own individual. So it's finding something that resonates with who who you are, who we are, who I am as a person. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been such a fantastic conversation, Shala. Thank you so much for um, uh, devoting some time to speak with me today. Um, as Thanks we wrap up our conversation, I wanted to ask if you have anything you'd like to share with the audience. Is there Are there any projects coming up, website information you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah. Well, you know, COVID has caused us all to pivot. And um, uh, I'm doing some pivoting too. And I've had some other issues in my life uh, that have caused that. My website is the yogamd.ca for dot Great Canada. website name. Yeah. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> because I'm... if I called it shalavadia.com, nobody would know how to spell it. So exactly. here's yeah. the deal. Many of us <laughs> with ethnic names have to change. Um, one day, one day it'll be, you'll see it come up. But right now it's the yogamd.ca. Um, yeah, I am starting to, uh, I'll, you know, I have future plans to do yoga teacher trainings for people who are in the healthcare profession so that we're blending that, you know, kind of bringing back mindfulness to the roots because that's spreading so much. Um, I ha And I'll also be offering my burnout program for healthcare professionals online. You don't necessarily have to be a patient to, uh, to get that. And um, I'm also working on my reconnect concussion program also based on it. So um, if you sign up at the yoga MD or if you go there, you'll find the information as it's evolving. Um, I'm on Instagram at the yoga MD.ca. I'm on Facebook at the yoga MD. And that's where the Facebook is where I usually share the health and the science stuff. Um, yeah. And it's on, I'm on Twitter under Shalavadia. So. Excellent. Well, <laughs> yeah. thank you for sharing all of that and be sure to follow Shalavadia, who I've been speaking to. Um, uh, Shala, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me.